Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Three Content Strategies to Start the School Year Right. I'm Susan McGuire, Senior Editor, Collection Management and Library Outreach at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. To resize the slides, look to the magnifying glass icons located to the left of the slides. There you can increase or decrease the size and select how you'd like the slides to appear. If you lose audio or would like to change the way you're connected to it, look at the bottom of your screen for a circle with three dots. Clicking that icon will open a menu with an audio connection option. If you experience any issues during the webinar, click on the FAQ webinars in the drop-down menu at the top of your WebEx screen to view a PDF with answers to commonly asked webinar questions. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the right side of your screen is a control panel with an area at the bottom for Q&A. Simply type your question into the field and click Send. Attendees can see questions asked during the webinar and the answers provided. Links to today's slides were sent directly to you from WebEx at the start of the webinar, but you can also download the slides at any time by copying the URL on the screen into your web browser. This afternoon, all attendees will receive an email containing a link to today's slide presentation and certificate of completion. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Susan London, Maria Fez, and Sheila Henline, who all work in collection development at OverDrive. As the Collection Development Specialist with Overdrive, Inc., Sheila monitors shared collections platforming such, per, sorry, performing such duties as processing holds, reviewing student requests, and curating collections. Her content specialties include juvenile and young adult fiction and nonfiction, folk and fairy tales, and all things crafty. Prior to joining the Overdrive team, Sheila worked in a high school library. Maria has been a content specialist at Overdrive for one year. Prior to Overdrive, Maria earned her MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh and worked in both community college and public libraries. She loves to read fantasy, contemporary romance, YA, and narrative nonfiction. Aside from reading and, and Overdrive, Maria plays cello, watches baseball, and takes lazy walks with her hound dog, Olive. Susan is a content specialist for the education team. She got her ML, MSLS from Clarion University in Pennsylvania. Prior to joining Overdrive, she worked at Shaker Heights Public Library for 10 years, first as a children's librarian and later as an adult services librarian. She loves reading mysteries, thrillers, and craft books. She has five wonderful children and a granddaughter named Clara. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sheila, Maria, and Susan. The floor is yours. Thanks for having us. Hi, everybody. This is Maria. Um, I'm going to talk about some YA titles. So October, how about Teentober? Um, Teen Read Week and Teen Tech Week are being combined this year into just a whole month of teen reading um, fun. So get ready for that in October. I'm going to talk about some themes here that we um, see a lot in YA um, reluctant readers, dealing with trauma, own voices, and some narrative nonfiction. So let's get started on some titles. Um, so there are all sorts of reasons kids may be unwilling to read, lack of interest, difficulty reading, or um, some sort of negative association with reading. So hopefully these two titles will spark your interest to spark their interest in reading. Um, the first title I wanted to talk about is Manning Up by B. Walsh. It's out October 1st. Um, it's about a small town football hero who is grappling with body dysmorphia, and this is told through verse. Um, Jack is a senior running back on the football team. He's dominating every opponent. Um, to everyone else, Jack is totally in control. In reality, he struggles with an eating disorder that controls every aspect of his daily life. When Jack starts using steroids, he feels invincible, but will the steroids help him win the big game or will he lose everything he's ever worked for? And Kirkus calls this a lightweight title for reluctant readers and a heavyweight for those facing body dysmorphia. So this can be used in a couple of different ways um, for people maybe dealing with these problems or um, as um, something to pull in reluctant readers with some larger issues. The Speed of Falling Objects by Nancy Richardson Fisher is also out October 1st. It's a part adventure, part coming of age novel, and altogether a page turner. Um, Danger Danny Danielle Warren is no stranger to falling. 
After losing an eye in a childhood accident, she has to relearn her perception of movement and space. Now Danny keeps her head down, studies hard, and works to fulfill everyone else's needs. She's certain that her mom's bitterness and her TV star father's absence are her fault. When her dad calls with an offer to join him to film the next episode of his popular survivalist show, Danny jumps at the chance to prove she's not the disappointment he left behind. But when their small plane crashes in the Amazon and a terrible secret is revealed, Danny must face the truth about the parents she worships, falling in love with a co-star, and finding her own inner strength to light the way home. So this just sounds like all kinds of fun drama. Um, and um, School Library Journal described it as a standout addition to the young adult survivalist story canon. Next up, we have some uh, dealing with trauma sort of titles, um, whether it's an abusive household, dealing with an STI, a harrowing accident, characters dealing with trauma can help teens really learn and empathize with others. Um, one that I think sounds like a really cool book that I will probably um, put on my to-read list is Gravity by Sarah Deming. It's out November 12th. Um, this is about a boxing talent who comes from a, a broken home. Um, that she uh, lives with her brother, Ty, who is younger than her, and she just lives with her mom who inflicts abuse and neglect due to a drinking problem. So she's training. She's winning all these matches. And she's trained for the Olympics, but then there's a lot of issues that are coming around at home as well. And so with these Olympic dreams, Gravity will have to decide what is worth fighting for. Cool thing about this is that the author was an amateur boxer and also is a journalist who does boxing correspondence. So very evident she knows what she's talking about um, when she talks about the training process and like boxing bouts. Full Disclosure by Cameron Garrett is out on October 29th. This is an uplift, uplifting, sex-positive debut about an HIV-positive teen falling in love and learning to live her truth. Simone Garcia Hampton is starting over at a new school, and this time things will be different. She's making real friends, making a name for herself as the student director of Rent, and making a play for Miles, the guy who makes her melt every time he walks into her room. The last thing she wants is for word to get out that she's HIV-positive because last time things got ugly. As Simone and Miles start going out for real, shy kisses escalating into much more, she feels an uneasiness that goes beyond butterflies. She knows she has to tell him that she's HIV positive, especially if sex is a possibility, but she's terrified of how he'll react. And then Simone finds an anonymous note in her locker that threatens to reveal her secret to everyone if she doesn't stop hanging out with Miles. So this is a, really intense topic, uh, but written at an accessible level for ages 14 to 18. And uh, it's kind of talking about protecting her secret at all costs, but also gaining a deeper understanding of prejudice and fear in her community and how to rise above that. Scars Like Wings by Aaron Stewart is out on October 1st. Um, this is a story about a serious burn victim who is going back to high school after an accident um, destroyed her entire world. She lost her parents and she's now living with her aunt and uncle. Um, she meets a fellow survivor and she begins to feel like maybe she doesn't have to face the nightmare alone. Um, but then there's another boy that becomes involved and she's trying to create a life again. Um, but now her friend um, must decide if she's going to fade back into her scars or let people by her side help her fly. This has positive reviews from Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, and School Library Journal. Um, Stewart focuses on the internal challenges of survivors affected by trauma without sugarcoating their circumstances. So this is a lot about not all scars are evident to the eye um, and that a lot of times you have to push through to get readers to think about empathy, hope, and resilience through trauma. And that's what this book is going to do. All right. Next up, we've got some own voices titles. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these individually, but um, Our Wayward Fate is um, a new work from the author of American Panda. This is out October 15th. This is a uh, Taiwanese, um, Taiwanese American family and protagonist, a teen outcast, is simultaneously swept up in a whirlwind romance and down a rabbit hole of dark family secrets when another Taiwanese family moves into her small, predominantly white Midwestern town. 
Panic by Sasha Dawn comes out October 1st. Um, I think this one sounds really interesting because it's about uh, dealing with anxiety, but coming from someone who is already famous and is successful. So this is about a, a childhood performer whose father is a Broadway and television producer. So she's enjoying these insider connections, um, but really she's struggling under the surface. Her parents are divorced and she has a lot of struggle with panic attacks and undiagnosed anxiety. Um, and Fergus calls this one compelling and captivating. So that's Panic by Sasha Dawn. Nick Stone is back with another one. This is a hard-hitting story about class, money, both a little bit and too much, and diverse characters. This is going to be a hit with teens, teachers, and parents alike called Jackpot. And I hope you get this message. It's out on October 22nd. It's a YA novel debut where three teens must face down the mistakes of their past after they learn that life on Earth might end in less than a week. So this has a little bit of a sci-fi tinge to it, but not much. It's still rooted mostly in um, a realistic plot. It's just that, you know, Earth might end in less than a week. So there you go. Um, but it's a diverse cast, Pakistani, American Muslim, characters and siblings who identify as gay, single parent homes. It's going to appeal to a lot of readers. Um, and also readers of both science fiction and realistic fiction. All right. Next up, we've got narrative nonfiction. Um, I probably sound more excited than you are about nonfiction, but um, I think that, especially nowadays, nonfiction for kids and teens is way cooler than it was when I was younger. So now I actually want to read these books too. Um, so narrative nonfiction, have been um, really great, whether it's written specifically for YA or it's taking some of the narrative nonfiction that's been popular with adults and coming out with a young reader's edition. But these two are specifically for YA. Game of, Games of Deception, the true story of the first U.S. Olympic basketball team at the 1936 Olympics in Hitler's Germany. That is the entire subtitle, which is basically entirety of what the book is about. Um, it's out November 5th. And the cool thing about this one is it doesn't just go into the how basketball became, you know, an international sport and became popular in the U.S., but it also takes into account that time period and how Germany was trying to sweep things under the rug during the Olympics and um, how there was a lot of, you know, kind of uh, lying and propaganda going on while the basketball team was there. So a lot of historical um, goodies in there as well as the sports aspect of it. And then Spies, this one looks so cool. The Secret Showdown Between America and Russia by Mark Favreau is out on October 1st. It's a thrilling account of the Cold War spies and spycraft that changed the course of history. Uh, so basically this is about explaining the role that secret operations have played in America's history and its national security. Um, and they kind of go into the turbulence of the Cold War and specific historical figures. And uh, from Kirkus, they said, Ian Fleming couldn't have dreamt us anything better, which I feel like that's got to be cool, right? <laughs> so this is on my to-read list. I think that if uh, teens are going to want to learn anything, you might as well just almost trick them into doing so. I'm just kidding. I'm sure some of them love this kind of stuff. Uh, but this, I think, would be a really great um, uh, you know, kind of springboard to reading some more narrative nonfiction. And that is all I have. I'm going to hand it over to Sheila to talk about Hour of Code. Thank you, Maria. Um, I decided to talk today about the Hour of Code. Um, if you haven't heard about this, the Hour of Code is an event planned for the week this year of December 9th through the 15th. Um, I'm going to show you some titles to help instruct our students about this coding event and to prepare for, for use of this event. Uh, first, I want to emphasize some educational and librarian standards and programs that you could use to support the curriculum or your STEM initiatives in your school community and to document your vitality in your community. Um, first up is the ISTE standards. These standard bands um, may be uh, consulted, um, the knowledge constructor band, the innovator designer band, and the computational thinker band. Um, future Ready Librarians, um, Consulting the Wheel, I ask you to consider the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Band by using the Curating Digital Resources for your students, Build Instructional Partnerships by working with other professionals in your district, 
and empower students as creators through your STEM or makerspace programs. Also with the Future Ready Librarians, the robust infrastructure to ensure equitable digital access um, and you could use your OverDrive SOAR or Libby service to provide that for your students. Um, I ask you to consult and reference the computer science curricular standards from the K-12 computer science uh, standards, which is supported by many leading science business partners and various departments of education throughout the United States. I also encourage you to use your State Department of Education's library, technology, or computer science standards. Now, the American Library Association has the ALA Ready to Code program, which is an initiative of the American Library Association in partnership with Google. It focuses on the role of school and public libraries in providing opportunities for the nation's youth to develop computational thinking skills through coding activities and other computer science education programs. Um, also, if you're going to the AASL conference this November, there will be um, three um, uh, sessions and a uh, roundtable to discuss coding. Um, now, on to some titles. They restricted me to how many I can talk about today, but you'll see I have a lot up here. Um, it's the librarian in me. I'm, I apologize. Um, you know, you ask me to find a book, I'll find you 10. So first up, let's go to uh, Mission HTML by Sheila Pruitt. Um, it's a learning, learn, learner publishing group publication from 2020, um, recommended for grades four to seven, has about 32 pages. There's four in this series uh, in the mission. Um, it includes HTML, which I have here, JavaScript, Python, and Ruby. Um, techie, it has a techie style layout, easy to read, and follow instructions. The publisher says your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to learn HTML and use it to create web page. Um, HTML is a type of code that makes a set of letters, numbers, and symbols appear on your phone or computer as a streamlined page of text and images. Learn the basic of this type of code and follow step-by-step -step instructions to complete your HTML mission. So if you're a um, Mission Impossible fan, there you go. Um, I also wanted to talk about How Coding Works by Ben Hubbard. This is a capstone title from 2017, recommended for grades one through three, it's 24 pages. Um, it's part of our Digital Planet series, which includes um, using digital technology, staying safe online, how computers work, and of course, how coding works. Um, this has larger type, colorful, it's very colorful, glossary, it has, includes a glossary, and has multicultural photos. You'll learn about coding, algorithms, and more. Now, let's step into Disney, shall we? Um, Disney's everywhere and Disney's into coding. So we're going to code with Anna and Elsa. And this is by Kiki uh, Portsman, and I'll get back to her a little bit later. This is a learner publishing uh, group, 2019 title, uh, grades two to five recommended. It's about 48 pages long. There are six series, uh, six titles in this series, which include Bugs and Errors with Wreck It Ralph, Looping with Finding Dory, Algorithms with Frozen. Conditionals with The Incredibles 2, Disney Coding Adventures, and of course, our coding with Anna and Elsa. Um, capturing on the popularity of the Disney brand, this series may be a great addition for your tech library. Disney characters throughout continue to graphically display instructions that are easy to read. Booklist describes the bulk of the book, however, comprises increasingly challenging coding projects with step-by-step -step directions. Um, now let's pick out Train Your Brain with Activities Using Loops. This is part of the Think Like a Programmer series, and there's six titles in this series by Emily Hillman, um, published 2020. This is a, a Cavendish Square and about 32 pages, grade for grades three to six. It has good instructions uh, for practical activities, exploring loops, minimal graphics, and it has multi cultural cartoonish people represented. Um, I will go over how to be a coder. Again, this is another title by Kiki Protzman and a DK Dorlin Kindersley book from 2019. This one's a little thicker, 144 pages, great for get grades two to four. I bring this one up because it uses crafts to teach the coding skills and logic. 
There's no computer needed. Uh, the various STEAM activities will help teach children the crucial skills of logical thinking that will give them a head start from when they begin programming on a computer. Um, great, great engaging graphics, diagrammed instructions, and perfect for your program. Um, this is the second title I brought up by this um, writer because Kiki Pratsman is a computer science educator and a YouTube channel presenter. Her channel is Kiki versus IT. We have many other titles that are professional development as well as career guides. I um, encourage you to look at those. Um, thanks for listening to my Hour of Code presentation. Now for Susan. Thank you, Sheila. Well, I'm going to talk about culinary kid cookbooks. That's some really nice alliteration. <laughs> um, there are many benefits to cooking with kids, including bonding and family time, developing fine motor skills, improving on math ability, improving on reading skills, following directions, introducing kids to scientific concepts, and teaching life skills, which includes healthy eating. Um, cooking is also a STEM activity. STEM, for any of you who might not know, stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Cooking involves calculating the cost of ingredients, taking accurate measurements, comparing weight versus volume, experimenting with stages of matter, chemical reactions and physical changes, microbiology, like spoilage, decomposition, and food safety, package design, and following the steps in a recipe, which, Sheila, is similar to learning coding skills. <laughs> also, cooking shows for kids and adults are very popular. There's Master Chef Junior, Kids Baking Championship, Food Network Star Kids, uh, Top Chef Junior, Chop Junior, and the Great British Bake Off, just to name a few. So with all of that in mind, I'd like to discuss some fun and interesting books about cooking. Starting with juvenile nonfiction, my first title is Eye Candy. Candy isn't just for eating anymore. This is a juvenile nonfiction title aimed at ages 8 to 14 and includes 11 recipes of creative, imaginative creations such as sweet sushi and a lollipop disco ball, all highlighted with colored photos and required tools. There are some easy recipes that don't require cutting or cooking, such as the candy shake and mix and match monsters, and some that will require teen or adult supervision, since they include the use of a knife or the stove, such as rolled up roses and licorice twist butterflies, which also requires the use of an iron. The book includes an ingredients glossary and a read more section with other titles to reference. Next up, we have amazing recipes you can make and share. The Sleepover Girls are planning the best birthday party ever. This juvenile nonfiction title is perfect for middle grade students. There are 12 recipes. Um, most include the use of a microwave and or a blender. Some fun and easy recipes include birthday cake corn, which is a popcorn ball with chocolate chips, marshmallows, and cake mix, presented in a cupcake liner with a lollipop on top, and a dessert pizza made from brownies and topped with cream cheese, fruit, and chocolate syrup. Yum. Also included is a test of your kitchen IQ with questions such as how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon, there are three, and the proper temperature for cooked chicken, which is 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Next up is Minecraft, the Minecrafters Cookbook. Do you love Minecraft? There are over 40 kid-friendly Minecraft-themed recipes for kids and parents to make together. Recipes include a picture of the finished dish, easy to follow directions, tools required, and cooking tips, as well as illustrations of favorite Minecraft characters and scenes. This is a juvenile nonfiction title suitable for ages 6 to 11. The winter holidays will be here before we know it, and we can kick them off with a Christmas cookbook. Simple recipes. This is a juvenile nonfiction title, perfect for elementary age kids. There are seven recipes and sections on metric conversions, kitchen tools and their descriptions, and food preparation techniques. Recipes include detailed instructions with color pictures of each step. 
Some recipes do not include the use of knives or the stove, such as North Pole pie. Where knives or a toaster are required, readers are told to have an adult handle those tasks. No recipes require the use of the oven. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as with other capstone kids titles, there's a read more section with other resources and a link for facthound.com with a code to find internet sites related to the book. My next title is Chef Gino's Taste Test Challenge, 100 plus winning recipes that any kid can cook. This is a juvenile nonfiction title suitable for grades five and up. It includes tips for parents on cooking with kids, Chef Gino's kitchen rules, kitchen tools and their uses, and photos of the food as it is being prepared, as well as the finished dishes. Recipes include soups, salads, pasta, stuffed vegetables, and layered foods such as eggplant parmigiana, called egg plenty in the cookbook, and rainbow tower, also known as salad in a jar. Most recipes are relatively quick to prepare and accessible to tweens with some kitchen experience or an adult nearby. And now we're going to move to the YA audience. Our next title is Sweet Revenge, Passive Aggressive Desserts for Your Exes and Enemies. Dump by your boyfriend, lab partner not doing their part, get out your rolling pin and sharpest knives and kill your enemies and exes with kindness through baking. This is a YA nonfiction title, perfect for ages 14 to 18. Recipes have clever names such as Every Day I Regret Us Some More, you're the Devil Food Cake, and Donut Call Me Again. The book also includes tags to add to your finished recipes with sayings such as, Happy Breakup Aversary, and Be My Ex Valentine. <laughs> Sounds like a fun one. Next up, another YA title, Teen Chef Cooks, 80 Scrumptious Family Friendly Recipes. This is brand new this month. The author, Elena de las Casas is an award-winning chef and the 2016 Shop Team Grand Champion. She's been cooking since she was four years old and helping her mom out in the kitchen. Her stated mission is to inspire families to cook creatively for themselves and live healthier lives. The title is classified as adult nonfiction, but it's suitable for grades six and up. Included are over 75 seasonal recipes broken out by season, and a, selection including, a section including a list of produce available during that season, along with more typical recipes like chicken piccata and spinach and mushroom quiche, there are more unusual dishes, such as avocado fries with sriracha sour cream, cilantro root beer pork sliders, and ginger yam hash. All recipes include locally grown fresh ingredients. Lastly, in the nonfiction category is Say Cheese, a kid's guide to cheese-making recipes from mozzarella, cream cheese, feta, and other favorites. This is a juvenile nonfiction title suitable for ages 8 to 12. The authors, Ricky and Sarah Carroll, are a mother-daughter team that own and operate the New England Cheese-Making Supply Company in Massachusetts. This is a how-to guide to making cheese at home. Covered our essential ingredients in cheese making, as well as the science of cheese and tools of the trade. Color photos and illustrations enhanced the instructions and included our 10 recipes for soft cheeses, great moments in cheese history. For instance, did you know that there are more than 2,000 varieties of cheese made around the world? And the global favorite is mozzarella. There's also recipes to enjoy making with cheese, such as ricotta pancakes and itty-bitty lasagnas. Well, I feel I would be remiss if I didn't also include a couple of fiction titles <clears throat> on cooking and cooking shows for kids. The first one is Next Best Junior Chef, Lights, Camera, Cook. This is a juvenile fiction book, perfect for grades two to five. It's the first title in a three-part series following four pre-teen contestants competing on a reality TV contest. This is a story about cooking, friendship, and discovering one's strengths and values. School Library Journal called this a must read for all junior foodies. My second fiction title is The Donut King. This is the second title in a series called The Donut Fix. It's a juvenile title suitable for ages eight to 12. 
12-year-old Tris Levin has a booming donut business, and it's going so well that he can't keep up. He'd like to purchase an expensive donut-making machine to help the business. To earn the money for the machine, he enters a televised kids cooking contest, hoping to win the big prize. This is a fun read with a really satisfying conclusion. And that concludes my kids and teen cookbooks. Um, next, we're going to Regis. All right, thank you, Susan. Thank you, ladies. Those were fantastic. I jotted a couple titles down myself, and I definitely took a note of those birthday cake popcorn balls. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Checking those out. Yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So uh, my name is Regis Kostelak. I am an account manager on the Overdrive education team. I work with schools in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And today I'm going to show you uh, Sora. Now, for those of you that don't know, Sora is our education platform. It's where students whose schools have the Overdrive service can go to access their school's books and titles. So it is essentially the sister app to Libby. Um, and I'm going to share my screen out so that you can see exactly what it looks like. And we're going to do a little demonstration here. So you'll see I'm in the browser. Uh, Sora is really nice because it works in a browser for those schools that use Chromebooks and devices like laptops. Uh, it's also an app, though, available in the iOS store and the Google Play App Store as well. So it's sort of device agnostic, we call it. You can get on any way possible. Uh, and I'm just going to log in the way a student would to my own account. You'll see I'm using a student ID. So it's very easy, very seamless for students. And I'm taken right away to my home page. Now, I'll come back to my home page in just a moment. But what you'll see is that if a book has been assigned to me, uh, as their eyes were watching, God has been assigned to me, and I'm supposed to be doing it for in-class reading, that's going to be the first thing that I see when I log in. So you'll note that and some other differences between the Libby app, which is more focused on public library patrons. But this is especially highlighting the tools that a student would need to succeed. So I'm going to flip into my Explore tab again. This should be very familiar if you've seen Libby, if you're familiar with that. But as I scroll down here, we've got uh, some specific collections that are tailored to our students and what they're going to be focused on in school and in class, what our teachers and our librarians want to draw attention to. So I will go into one of these lists. And I will borrow a book. As soon as I borrow it, it will open up. I've read this book before, so it'll take me right to where I left off. And you'll see it's synchronizing automatically. So now I'm in the book. Again, if you're familiar with OverDrive's public library uh, platform, you've seen this before. Some tools that you may need in the school that students are using uh, are definitions. So I can come right in to the word dismay. Maybe I'm not familiar with that. Click, hold, highlight, and define that word in the text so it's not taking me anywhere else. I don't have to read with a dictionary on my lap. Very helpful. Uh, I can keep scrolling through, and maybe I want to click, hold, and highlight a big chunk of text, take a highlight of that, save a note for later, different colors. I don't have to carry around my three highlighters and say, what a passage. Wow. And then I can save these notes. So it's really nice because, again, these are students typically using these for school or for self-directed reading. Uh, so we don't want them writing in books. But by taking these notes, we know that it will go to the next student as a clean copy. And when they check it back out, it will go straight to them. Of course, we have our reading settings here that are very important. Um, I can increase the size of the text. Excuse me one moment. I can increase the size of the text, decrease it. I can change the backlighting here, and I can change the font, and we have this open dyslexic font. So this is great for students with dyslexia or other reading difficulties because you'll see it's recommended to use this weighted font so the, the letters don't flip themselves around for those students on a yellow background, which has been proven to help students with dyslexia. So it's a sticky setting, meaning once they change the setting once, every book will open that way for them. So we're really pushing these personalization tools to make uh, everything easier for students. So I'll close out of the book here, and you'll see I'm back in the Explore page, back where I'm at. Now I'm going to flip into my home page. As I mentioned, if you have an assignment, it'll show up right there. But some things that you might need below that. Remember, I took that definition. It's right there for me. And now I have a personalized bank 
of words that I've had trouble with. I can reference this. I can work on these words throughout the school year, or I can click on this funny little icon up here, and I can export it right to my Google Drive account, to my Google Classroom, and send it to my teacher. And now teachers can create vocabulary lists based on the words that their students are actually struggling with from text that they're actually reading. Uh, and I can do the same thing with notes and highlights. So you'll see, I can come down here. I can click into all of them, or I can just click on the jacket cover of a book that I just read. And same thing, it's telling me that I can export this directly to Google Drive, or if we don't use Google Classroom, a PDF, or I can copy it to my clipboard. But now I can take the notes as I'm reading, send it straight to my teacher, uh, whether this is for an essay or for class discussion. And I can go back there. And then it'll just give some suggestions on books I might like. Uh, the shelf here is just your classic shelf. You'll see we do have offline access, though, the same way that Libby would, so that if students are going somewhere where they're not going to have reliable Internet access, they can always access their books uh, on their device. And then I'll go into this Me tab. The really fun thing with this Me tab is you'll see uh, different badges. We've sort of gamified this, so this is unique to Sora. They can earn badges as they do certain things, such as making a highlight, making a note, renewing a book, returning a book, or they can earn badges for positive reading habits. So reading two hours in a day, reading before 7 a.m., which I'm sure is a, you can see it's a challenge for me. I haven't earned that one yet. Uh, I'm busy before 7 a.m. Reading 15 minutes or more after 11 p.m. on a Friday or a Saturday, right? So making sure that we know what our students are doing, that they're not getting into trouble on those weekends. Uh, they're reading books. <laughs> so very fun things to get. And the other thing that's very useful for school districts here is personalized reading statistics. So the average time per session, the average time per book. You'll see, you just saw how I do my sessions. So three minutes is not as abysmal for me, but if a student was only reading three minutes per session, we might know that it's an issue. Uh, but you have that access to some student data there. And then the last thing I'll show you, which is very, very exciting, is if I flip into this hamburger menu on the side, the three-bar menu, you'll see I have the ability to add a public library. So I can, I'm just going to do my uh, zip code here. We are in Cleveland. We're actually in Garfield Heights. You'll see uh, the CleanNet collection is the Cleveland Public Library, Cuyahoga County Public Library as well. Any of the students can access whichever library is their home library, and then they can connect to it with a public library card. And what this pop-up notification is telling me is that we've filtered out the adult content. So because they're accessing through a school platform, we're not going to be showing them the Fifty Shades of Grey. We're not going to be showing them the romance novels. We want to make sure that they're seeing age-appropriate titles in here. So it's filtering to just juvenile and young adult materials, and now they have access right into the public library. So it's fantastic. It connects students from a platform they're already using into the school's public library collection. If I come in here and opt to borrow a book, it would just prompt me to sign in, and that is with a library card. So as I go back, you'll see I can flip back to my school account. And then when I search for a book, I have the ability to search all of my libraries. So if I was going to search for something like Wonder, you'll see in my school account it would come up, but if it's already out, I can uh, get it from my public library. So very easy. It's all about connecting students to books and increasing the amount of time that students spend reading because we know that has a direct correlation with their academic achievement. So Sora is, again, the school reading app, the student reading app that they're going to be using through their school platform. If you have any questions about this, we're happy to answer them. You can also ask uh, your OverDrive representative or your library uh, contact who works with the digital collection. So uh, thank you. That's all I have for you. And I am going to kick it back to Maria. Unshare. We're going to unshare the screen here. I think we've got one more page or do we have Q&A first? I think we've got some time for Q&A. About five minutes, I think. So if there are any questions, I believe you can put it in the Q&A, oh, I see one. Sure. So um, this is Susan McGuire back, back on, the, on the webinar. So um, I have gathered a couple of questions. One that just came in is, is OverDrive planning on adding some adult books appropriate for YA readers to the list in Sora? 
Great the question. Public, the adult audience, but yeah. Great question. Yeah. So right now, the way it is is we're just uh, we're showing just juvenile and YA materials. Our next update that's going to go into the Sora app will link directly to the grade level that the student is in, and if the school has designated that that grade level is allowed to see adult materials, we will show them adult materials but not mature adult. Um, and again, if there was anything that a student needed to get that the school, because this is all in the hands of the school district, if the school says, we don't want you accessing that through Sora, they're of course always welcome to access it via Libby and through their own public library card. Cool. Um, and then a, a quick question is, um, Sora is free, right? It's included with, if you uh, have an OverDrive account? Correct. It's a free app. It's a free application. It is used by schools that have our service. So the schools will uh, pay for the service the same way that libraries would. They have their own collection with us. But there are also trial options. There are um, uh, options to connect your school to Sora um, without paying for it. So the best thing to do, again, would be to talk to your library uh, collection specialist or to go to discoversora.com. So speaking of um, OverDrive collections, mm -hmm. what have you seen is a, a big challenge for folks who are trying to switch or add OverDrive? Like what, how do they get buy-in from their administration? How do they get their students on board? Absolutely, in, in a school district specifically? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I think uh, what Sheila was mentioning earlier in her presentation, is really a big part of that. It is about working with your administrators and focusing on those future-ready librarian concepts and explaining to them the role that digital takes in a student's life. As we know, uh, here in Ohio, all of our state testing is done digitally. We know that whether students are moving into college is the next step for them or their career, they're going to be needing digital tools, digital skills, and reading digitally. And those are skills that are not acquired quickly. So they need to work on those and build those up. The other thing to work with your administrators through is data. And there's a lot of data out there connecting uh, digital reading to student success. So working with them to look at how much are we circling in our library, how much are students reading as of now, and what can we do to increase that. And then connecting to any, uh, any makerspace or other library initiatives that are going on. Unfortunately, we know that school libraries, uh, at least the book part of it, does tend to be shrinking in some areas. So this is a really great way to provide the same amount or more books even as your physical space is repurposed. So it's really about identifying what's going on in your school or district and tying in with your administrators and working together with them because it's a, it's a team effort. Yeah, and you mentioned um, shrinking space, but I, I think um, a lot of schools are also maybe contending with a shrinking library budget. So, so what um, advice or tips do you have for schools that are uh, trying to pinch their pennies? Absolutely. There's a lot that can be done there. We've actually uh, seen a lot of research that shows that using digital class sets or ebooks in the classroom will actually end up saving the district money over years because, again, these are digital books and we offer a, a version of a class set where you're not damaging the books, you're never losing the books, they remain in your collection forever. So there's a lot of long term financial benefits to using digital. And then the other thing that we'll do is share collections. So districts that are pooling their resources, uh, joining consortia uh, to provide more books at a lower uh, entry cost. The idea of never having to replace a book is so appealing to me. Um, <laughs> does, um, so in terms of the, the lending period and um, when mm -hmm. a, a book expires, is that the same as with um, the overdrive that folks are familiar with from their public library? So it's it's similar, yeah, insurance. where the, the lending models, um, it's yeah. similar. Schools have different, uh, in some cases, different lending models from the publishers as the public library. It's not all exactly one-to-one. -one. Um, and okay. then one of the big ones is called a class set that if schools have access to that libraries don't. Um, but okay. it is similar in that way. 
All right. So um, let's just do one more question. Um, well, now, uh, Regis it mentioned being the rep for West Virginia. So I'm going to ask, um, as someone who used to live in West Virginia, if you have any <laughs> advice for homes or, or for a school library that serves families that don't have access to Wi-Fi, uh, regular access to Wi-Fi at home, how can they, how can you help them? Yeah, absolutely. I think the best thing to do, and we know that that is a challenge in a lot of places, not just West Virginia, but a lot right. of places around the country. Um, I think the best thing to do is to understand where your resources are and how you can access them. And so if the school district or the public library offers free internet, it's really good to leverage that time that you're there to bring your devices there uh, and download the books. That's why I'm such a big fan of both Libby and Sora, having the ability to take those devices offline and use them freely, whether it's an audiobook or an ebook. The nice thing too about Sora is if you're taking notes in the offline mode, when you go back online, all of those notes will up to upload to the cloud. But understanding where those resources are, where and when it is that you do have reliable access to, to Wi-Fi or to internet, and then working with your uh, community members, if it is your school district or your public library, to make sure that they're aware of those challenges because uh, you have to sort of, unfortunately, you do have to be vocal in those situations, especially with, when it's an issue that doesn't affect the entire school population. Um, you mm -hmm. have to make sure that those members of the school district are aware that you or your student is struggling with that issue. Yeah. That that old digital divide. That old um, digital divide, yes. Right. So has anybody um, talked about how their school's approach to teaching has changed since they started using Sora? Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Susan? Uh, has anybody mentioned how their school's approach to teaching has changed since they switched over? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sora? So first things first, I mean, this is new not just for students but for teachers. So it's an entirely different model of, uh, of instruction. So it's about making sure that you have access to the digital resources, that you're connecting your students to it and feeling comfortable doing so. And the big thing that administrators are looking for that maybe teachers don't focus on as much day to day is that data. So it may feel weird sometimes to, to be concerned with your students' you know, reading habits or reading data but that is what the administration is looking for in a lot of cases. So it's working together with them on that and then being flexible. The other nice thing about uh, using digital resources that can affect your teaching is that it provides that flexibility of trying a new title at a much lower cost. So I've seen a lot of my own districts experiment with teaching books like The Hate You Give because initially they may not be uh, ready to commit to purchasing that book uh, for a five-year cycle, but because they can rent a title or because they can use a, a short-term lease, they can try it for the first year and then see if it works being incorporated into their classroom. Cool. And I have um, a question from Susan McGuire, who's me. Um, you <laughs> talked about data. Is the data that you gathered that um, – I know with a lot of library ILS systems, the patron information is stripped away, so you can see what's circling, where it's coming from, and stuff like that. Is that the same um, with the data that, that you all provide? Yeah, so when looking at the student data specifically, Susan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so here at Overdrive, we're very concerned with making sure that we're uh, up to snuff on all of the uh, privacy practices. At, uh, that schools have to deal with. And so it's a very similar thing where we may have district trends, we may be able to see how an entire grade or group of students is doing, but we are not identifying individual students. The student will be able to see their own reading data. They'll have access to that mm -hmm. themselves in their Me tab, as you saw in Sora, but we are not allowing uh, the administration or the teachers to look directly at that student's data. Um, so it is sort of a balancing act there. Yeah, it, it's um, it's good to have specific data, you know, so you can see, oh, the sixth graders are doing this or whatever. But yeah, too specific is 
dangerous for our patrons, I guess. Right, um, and we are we are all for, you know, just reading in general. So we don't want anyone looking over the metaphorical shoulder of a student and saying, hey, you only read four minutes last night. Why was that? And the answer very simply is, well, I, I have the print book. You know, so right. we, want to, we want to make sure that we're working for the best of the student. That's great, and, and encouraging lifelong readers, which makes everyone right. a better person, as you all know. All right, well, um, that seems like a good place to wrap up the Q&A. So thank you all for everybody's questions. Thank you for your answers. And I'm going to turn it over to the OverDrive folks one more time. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, just a little heads up, if you do want to uh, follow us, stay connected, um, we have a blog, we have Facebook, we have all the things, basically. Um, I really enjoy following everything Overdrive related on Twitter, um, mostly because it's kind of the only reason I go on Twitter. So if you are um, wanting to keep up with us, those are all the ways to get in touch. Um, if you do know your Over Overdrive representative and you have more questions about um, anything we talked about on the webinar or with Sora, um, please reach out to them. I know they're always happy to talk to you, and uh, thanks so much. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to everybody, to all the wonderful panelists today, and um, here they are one more time. All right. So this afternoon, all attendees will receive an email containing a link to today's slide presentation, the title list, and that very important certificate of completion. You'll also receive a notice when the video archive of today's webinar is posted at www.booklistonline.com slash webinars. Please visit that same URL to learn more about Booklist's upcoming webinars, view an archive of past webinars, or register for upcoming webinars like the ones you see here. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors are posting weekly about all things books and library land. Booklist has a digital edition of the magazine, which you can connect to your subscription online. This format pairs the page-by-page -page reading experience of print with the convenience of online access, and it's included free with all Booklist subscriptions. If you're not yet a subscriber, you can take advantage of this special webinar offer to get print, online, digital, and archive access to Booklist for only $99. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for today's webinar. One more thank you to our sponsor, OverDrive, and this concludes today's webinar.